Hey viewers, Nick Carver here, and we're doing an image review of the pictures that I took on my most recent on-location video to the Sonoran Desert. So I guess that's a thing I'm doing now. On-location video, then come back and talk about the pictures. Now I wish I could have done this video uh, like right after the trip, right after I got back. It's been a little while since I took the trip now, but um, what can I say? Papa's got bills to pay, so I had to get to work. Uh, I've just been busy with work, haven't had a chance to do this video. But better late than never, so let's talk about the pictures. Now before we talk about the pictures, actually, I want to show you how I planned this trip, because that might be of interest to anyone who wants to plan their own trip. Let me show you how I do it. So as I mentioned in the video, I wanted to photograph saguaros. Specifically, I wanted to get this one composition that I had uh, kind of pre-visualized last time I was in Arizona, but wasn't able to get. And uh, it had been knocking around in my brain for a while. I wanted to I wanted to go do it. I wanted to go get that composition. So if I want to shoot saguaros, I need to go where saguaros live, which is in the Sonoran Desert. And the Sonoran Desert is in Arizona. So I go to Google Maps here, and I hover over Arizona, and I start looking for, you know, what areas might have saguaros. Not really northern Arizona. I know Arizona good enough that saguaros are mostly towards the south. And I'm um, floating around. Hey, look outside, just outside of Phoenix. Sonoran Desert National Monument. Hey, they might have saguaro cactus. So I start zooming in and I start looking for terrain. You know, I want some topography. I don't want just completely flat. That's gonna be boring for pictures. I want some mountains or something to, to be a good background element. So I start zooming in and I see, hey, look, a couple of mountain ranges right here. Uh, or little clusters of mountains anyway, plateaus and all that deserty stuff. But I need to see if there's saguaros. So switch over to satellite view. And I just start zooming in. Ooh, this little valley might be a good place to camp. Let's see if there's any saguaros. Ah, look at what we have here. Hmm, I wonder if there's saguaros here. Yeah, look at those beauties. Look at all those shadows. That, my friends, is saguaro country. So then I think, okay, that's probably gonna be a good place to camp. Uh, let's see if there's a road to get out to that area. And uh, sure enough, there's a dirt road. You got the characteristic two tire tracks going through there. And I start following that, that dirt road back until it kind of reaches a highway. And uh, basically what I'm trying to establish here is if this place is actually accessible. Um, now it's hard to tell if there's going to be you know, fences or anything like that, but I can get a rough idea of whether or not a road even gets there. Now, once I've found a spot that I think is probably going to be promising for a campsite, I switch over to another app. This other app is called Gaia GPS, or Jaya, Jaya, Gaia. I don't know, I'm going to go with Gaia. All right, Gaia GPS. Now, this app is phenomenal. Um, it's a GPS app, and you can do so many overlays on the maps. There's uh, topography, there's contour lines, there's public land markings, there's uh, points of interest markings, satellites, streets, roads, everything you could want in a map, you can choose to show it or not. Um, but I go to the same spot uh, where I was looking on Google Maps, and I basically want to see that it's if it's public land or not um, and on Gaia here the the red is public land this blue area is military base so I gotta be careful not to cross that boundary but I'm looking for red land so I go to the same spot that I was looking at in Google and I go to that same kind of valley I was thinking of going to and uh, sure enough it's in the red it's public land and I like public land because there's a lot fewer rules at public land. I don't have to reserve a campsite. I don't have to pay for a campsite. I can just show up, pitch my tent, and I'm good. I'm fine. I don't have to get permits or anything. It's, it's easy. Nice and easy. So I see that it's in the red, which means that's where I want to go. Um, and then I basically just start plotting my, my route. Gaia has this great feature where you can... Uh, plan a route and it will snap to roads and trails that are already on there. So it'll actually follow the lines automatically for you. I don't have to draw them individually. That way I can get the exact mileage and all my turns and my waypoints and everything. So I plotted all these roads here and I figured I had, a, I had my bases pretty well covered. But, you know, as much as you plan, you just can't plan for the unplannable. And what I didn't plan for is uh, the road stopped existing at some point. So I started following my route, 
going along, going right towards my destination, following the trail perfectly, and then the road just kind of faded out, just kind of disappeared. And I was looking at the map, I tried so hard to find it and pick it up where it left off, but it just wasn't reachable. So all of this planning I did was all for naught. I couldn't go there anyway. So I had to come up with a plan B pretty quick. Um, again, I just went back to town so I'd get cell service. And I started looking at Google Maps again, pulled up Gaia GPS, and I found another spot just a little bit north. It was like a 20 minute drive north. And again, I found those saguaro shadows, uh, saw that it was public land, planned a route, and got myself into a spot that, was, uh, that would end up working out. So plan A didn't work, but all my plan A planning helped me come up with my plan B. So worked out in the end. But that's how I plan a trip. iPads and shadows. All right, let's start with the pictures shot on film. Come back to the digital pictures later. But let's look first at the 6x7s I shot with my uh, Mamiya RZ67. Um, now, as I've said before, I love using my Mamiya. It's a fun camera to use, and uh, when I'm using my 110mm 2.8, uh, you can really have a lot of fun with shallow depths of field. You can get such a razor-thin depth of field with that camera and that lens that, um, I don't know, it's just fun to do every now and then on a landscape. So. Doing these pictures, I was playing with some kind of lower vantage points. So getting real low to the ground uh, so that the ground was just kind of a sliver along the bottom of the frame, very low horizon. And I did that specifically to make the cactus look real tall and stately and impressive um, because it kind of rises or it drops the horizon, which makes them look a little taller. Um, and I think that worked well for a lot of these pictures. Now the color palette, as always with Kodak Portra, is just beautiful. I love it. I love how greens are rendered, I love how blues are rendered, and it's nice and soft, and uh, I don't know, I'm just hooked on it right now. Maybe I'll get over it eventually, but right now, I dig it. Um, you'll see here that I only shot one roll, and I didn't bracket at all. So none of these are duplicate, ex duplicate exposures. Uh, I'm pretty confident in my ability to get a correct exposure, so I tend not to bracket. Uh, but also when I'm shooting color negative film, I really don't bracket because it's so forgiving of incorrect exposure that why waste the film? Now, if you're shooting transparencies like Fuji Velvia, it is a lot less forgiving of incorrect exposure. So bracketing makes much more sense to me there. You know, two thirds of a stop off on your exposure, that might potentially ruin the shot on color transparency film. But on negatives, you're fine. Don't even worry about it. So be sloppy, it doesn't matter. Color negative films uh, afford you that luxury of being a little bit sloppy on your exposure. Um, so that's one of the many reasons I didn't bracket. Overall, I'm happy with these shots. I do like them. I wish I had done some more. I really like the results I get on my Mamiya with Kodak Portra, but um, I was just spread a little thin. Wanted to use my panoramic, baby. I wasn't going to be uh, cozying up to my Mamiya the entire trip. I had to break out that Shenhao. So let's talk about those panoramics shot with the Shen Hao. Um, first roll here, shot on Kodak Portra. Um, kind of warm ups, you know, my first compositions usually aren't my best. I felt like they got better as the day progressed. Uh, my second roll here, this is we're two of my favorite compositions from the trip. Um, now you'll notice on both of these rolls, I have duplicate pictures. Um, they are bracketed uh, a little bit, they're just bracketed one stop, but as I mentioned, that's almost not even worth doing on color negative film, because one stop is almost nothing on color negative film. That could be made up in the scan. But even when I don't bracket, if I'm doing my panoramic shots, I like to do at least two pictures. Um, so even if it's the same exposure, I like to do the same exposure twice. And that's because when you're dealing with a negative this big, uh, it doesn't take much to blemish the negative. It's so much real estate that there's, there's a lot of opportunity for something to go wrong on the negative. So I like to always have at least two. In-camera duplicates is what they call them. So basically you just take a second shot right after you do uh, a photo so that you have a, a duplicate right in your camera. And then that way if the first negative was damaged in some way, you got yourself a duplicate uh, lined up right behind it. Um, so I'm learning, I definitely need to do that. I should never take one composition and only expose one piece of film on it because uh, it's just risky. I've had it too many times where 
there's a, a big scratch right through a, a highly detailed area. And that's going to be a nightmare to try and remove in Photoshop. So uh, good to do in-camera duplicates when you're dealing with negatives this size. But now the first roll here, I think my first composition of the day, I, I like it. I think it's, uh, I think it's pleasing. I like all the negative space, um, the light coming from the right and the cactus on the left. I think it creates interest across the whole picture. So I'm pretty happy with that one. Uh, the second variation I did on the composition, I don't really like at all. So I basically just turn my camera to the left a little bit to get more of the mountain and move the cactus to the right. Um, to be completely frank, I don't like it. I think it's a, not a strong composition at all. But the first composition, I think it's pretty cool. I like that one. Now the second roll for the day, this first composition I think I mentioned in the video is one of my favorites. Um, I like how the cactus were laid out. Uh, I think I chose the right focal length and the right distance. and. Um, I don't know what to say, I just, I like it. I think it's cool. I would love to see this thing printed up big because there's a lot of great detail in here and you kind of lose that unless it's printed huge. Um, the next composition with the cactus right down the middle. Uh, this is the composition that kind of spurred the whole trip. So this is something I had envisioned in my head a while back, last time I was in Arizona. And all I needed was the perfect cactus, which boy, I found that baby, she was beautiful. Found the perfect cactus with a nice background. Now the two frames I did here, one of them was with a shallow depth of field, one of them was with a deeper depth of field. So one with, with a wide aperture and one with a uh, closed down aperture. And um, I think they both have their merits. I kind of like both of them. I thought I would like the shallow depth of field the most, but upon reviewing them later, I think I like the deep depth of field more. Uh, the shallow depth of field, I feel like there's so much of the picture that's out of focus that um, the attention is a little too concentrated towards the center of the picture. Uh, the one with the deeper depth of field is a little more interest throughout the entire picture, so I think that uh, keeps the eye engaged a little bit more throughout the shot. Um, centering things like this, I've said before, I do it probably too much. I love centering things. I don't know why. I try and fight it, but I just always end up coming back to it. So, uh, I don't know. Stick a fork in me and call me Wes Anderson, because... Uh, I like to center things. That's what he does, right? He centers everything. You always got like Owen Wilson centered in, in, a, in a movie. That's Wes Anderson, right? That's what I'm thinking of. All right, whatever. Let's look um, at the shots I took at sunset. So these are the ones shooting directly into the sun. Um, I was waiting for the sun to get in just the right position. Uh, the first picture I took was very early. Uh, the sun was not obscured at all by the mountain, so the sun was fully exposed. And as I mentioned in the video, I cannot believe there's no lens flare here. I don't even know how that's possible. Pretty much always, if you shoot into an open sun, not blocked by anything, you're going to get lens flare somewhere. So I don't know if the lens flare is outside of the frame, like it's below where the, the film would have been, or the lens is just really high quality. I, I have no idea how there's no lens flare here. But I'm glad there isn't because it's really cool. I get that full circle of sun and no lens flare. You almost never see that. The later pictures, the sun was partially obscured. So it's just peeking out from behind the mountain. That created a stronger starburst, uh, but there's less light down on the landscape. The more I look at these pictures, the more I, I think I like the first shot the most. The one where I thought there would be lens flare. The one where the sun was completely exposed. I like that there's sunlight still down on the landscape. You can see all the cactus down there kind of bathed in light. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this shot. Uh, as I said in the, in the on-location video, I kind of wanted this to have a similar vibe to my uh, desert layers picture that I took in Anza Borrego. And uh, I think I achieved that. It's got similar color palette and kind of that whole um, similar look. I wanted them to look like they're from the same series, and I think they are. So well done, me. And then my final uh, roll of film from the trip were these four cactus shot at dusk. Um, I took this picture almost exclusively because I thought the previous roll wasn't going to come out good at all. Little did I know the last picture wouldn't come out horribly. It actually ended up being one of my favorites from the trip, so this was kind of unnecessary. Uh, this picture I think came out pretty cool. I like the blue tones, but it was a pretty sloppy composition. I'm not going to lie. So I was setting up very quick and I was trying to race the light and I just didn't put as much thought into the composition as I might have liked. Probably not my favorite from the trip, 
I'll never print this out, I don't think, but um, not bad for how quick it was. Oh, and then uh, the black and whites. Didn't talk about those. So four by five black and whites. Uh, you'll see this one here that looks a little lighter. That was done with the, uh, the red filter. So it ended up darkening the sky. Remember, it's a negative, so the sky looks lighter here, but when it's inverted, uh, the sky comes out darker. So this is the one with the red filter. And um, did a shallow depth of field on this, blurred out the background just a bit. And I think it has a cool vibe. I like it. Uh, Saguaro's in black and white. You kind of just can't go wrong with that. Um, you know, they have such a timeless look to them, and they're kind of old westy in, in, uh, in their look. So if you do a black and white picture, it kind of matches that old west look. And uh, I think that works out. But definitely preferred it with the red filter. That darker blue sky looks much better. Polaroids, as always, not much to say about them. You know, Polaroids are fun. It's the main reason I do them. And uh, got myself a nice little stack from the trip. The color palette on the color photos here I think is interesting. Um, I don't know that I like it. I don't know that I hate it. I just think it's interesting. It's kind of peachy with blues, uh, which as I mentioned in the video, you know, it's always hard to predict how Polaroids are going to look. It's a little bit of a dice roll, and that's kind of half the point, you know. Uh, each picture is unique. They're really not like any other picture, and that can be kind of cool. But the black and whites, I dig. They look like wet plate because there's all those defects in it. Um, I think that's kind of fun. But Polaroids are pretty cool. Love me some Polaroids, as you guys know. Okay, that's it for the film photos. So let's take a look at the digital shots from the trip. Get it? It's a memory card on a light table. It's like a, as if I'm going to get my loop. <laughs> look at him. You know, so like a memory card. It's a, uh, uh, it's look at it. Let's look at him on a screen here. So, let's pull up the settings here. So we can talk about ISOs and all that fun technical stuff. So as you may have seen in the video, uh, these pictures were fun. Uh, this was definitely the most fun on the trip. Uh, running around doing the pop and flash on the, uh, the cactus here. Just good times. Um, I'm not a big nighttime photographer. I wouldn't say I'm very uh, experienced in it at all. So I was kind of guessing at my settings. And that took some time. I had to kind of dial it in. So, you know, just random guess at the ISO and shutter and aperture and then see how it comes out and adjust accordingly. I ended up using mostly ISO 2000, 2500, 4000, kind of in that range um, so that the shutter wouldn't go too long. And my aperture was typically around 7.1, 6.3, kind of in that territory. I didn't want the aperture too wide because I wanted to have a decent depth of field on the on the landscape there and you know i didn't want the shutter too long because then the stars would move too much and the moonlight would burn in too much and you know this is a guessing and checking trial and error but ultimately i settled on um this was about a quarter moon by the way and i settled on roughly iso 2500 20 to 30 seconds uh, at 7.1 and that seemed to work uh, for pretty much all the pictures now the gels I used are these old gels I had laying around from years and years and years ago. Uh, they were in this Koken, you know, Koken the filter manufacturer. I had gotten this like when I first got into photography, seriously like 15 years ago. And I had all these different colors and I was just combining colors, you know, to make the reds a little bit stronger. I would maybe add like a purple to the red um, to make it a really deep red. But again, it's just a lot of guessing and experimenting and all these cool colors. Um, just a lot of fun. After the trip, I ended up ordering a new set because I had so much fun with it. I wanted more colors. So I got this uh, thing here from B&H called Rogue. It's uh, made by Rogue. And it's got like every color you could possibly imagine. I mean, man, I can't wait to go out and use that one. Like, look at that. That is like the pinkest thing I've ever seen. That's going to be fun. So next time I'm out in front of some Joshua trees or some, uh, some other cactus, uh, I'm going to break out these bad boys, try some, try some vivid colors. Look how deep that blue is. I mean, geez. I would hold the gel over the top like this, so I didn't even rubber band it or anything. I just held it. And I would pop the flash using the uh, pilot light. So the, the little pilot light button on the back of the flash, I would just run around, pop it multiple times. And 
again, a lot of guessing and checking on how many different pops of flash to do. You know, I ended up getting around like seven or eight on most of the cactus. You know, they, they came out cool. It's super vibrant colors. Uh, I think they would look great printed on like metal or aluminum. That's not really my bag. It's not really my cup of tea, but it would look pretty cool. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious to go out and do this again. Uh, I want to find some Joshua trees and do it on that. I want to find some old train cars, try it on that. That's why I bought the extra gels. I'm going to do some real fancy colors next time. So, you know, before this trip, I was not a nighttime photographer, but maybe I am now. I did take some pictures that I didn't share in the on location video. Uh, some of them were of my truck because I'm one of those guys that takes pictures of his forerunner. I'm sorry. I, I really, I'm truly sorry. So I took some cool pictures of my truck and um, my campsite and all that. And then also on the way home from Arizona, I ended up staying a night in Joshua Tree with my brother and a friend of mine. And uh, we stayed near this cool old structure next to a mine. And I did some light painting there on the ruins there. And I think those came out pretty cool too. So that's it. That's all the pictures. That's all I have to say about them. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, thanks for watching the on location video. Remember, there's two parts, by the way. I hope you saw both parts. There's part one and a part two. And I hope you saw both. But thank you for the continued support. Thank you for the continued views. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, yeah, till next time.